so yeah, hello and welcome. If you've been a fan of this channel for some time, or at least watched a few of our previously uploaded videos, you'll agree that this type of video is a bit of a curveball to say the least. No long comical movie reviews or experimental comedy sketches today, although they will be hopefully back in action soon. Instead, I'm going to take a look back at one of my favourite video game franchises of all time, Prince of Persia. Mainly due to the fact that every sod is hunkered down in their house because of the coronavirus pandemic just now, and this seems like a semi-serviceable way to pass the time. So here we go. Just to clarify, I'll mainly only be looking at the Sands of Time trilogy, as those are the three games that I grew up playing and still enjoy thoroughly to this day. I'll be brief and say that I've never played any of the pop games prior to this trilogy, well except for the original game which was included as an easter egg in the Sands of Time. I don't even think I get past the first level on that. From what I've heard though, the first two games are pretty decent, with the second in particular having a solid cult following, and Prince of Persia 3D being a glitchy crock of shit. Moving much further forward, I have briefly played the 2008 Prince of Persia soft reboot and found it entertaining enough, but it strayed pretty far from what I'd come to love, so it wasn't really my cup of tea. Forgotten Sands however, I have completed a couple of times and had fun with, but it was a bit of a damp squib of a game. I had some great new platforming implementations such as being able to freeze water for a certain length of time, and bringing back certain sections of the environment from the past which no longer exist in the present. That was cool, but aside from that, it was a total rehash of the Sands of Time in every way, with the story, combat and boss battles taking a huge step back from where they were at the end of the original trilogy. Anyway, without further ado, let's get fired into this review and blabber on about what was the first Prince of Persia game for many, including myself, 2003's The Sands of Time. The story of the Sands of Time follows our nameless Prince of Persia himself, as his father's army are passing through India on the way to visit the Sultan of Azad, when one hell of an evil looking vizier entices them to attack the Maharaja's palace and loot many mythical artefacts within the treasure vaults to bring to the Sultan as gifts. Seriously though, why would the Prince and his father trust this slimy traitor? Look at him! Anyway, the Prince is eager to be the one to find the promised treasure and soon comes across the Dagger of Time which he almost immediately realises has the power to rewind time itself and could come in handy. Ha. Which is putting it lightly. The prince's father, King Sharaman, has also came to find the hourglass of time and decides to take that and the Maharaja's daughter, Farah, as gifts for a plump little sultan. This angers the hell out of the vizier as he wants to use the sand to gain eternal youth or some such thing. Basically he's an evil old bastard at death's door and refusing to enter. So upon visiting Azad, the vizier tricks the prince into releasing the sands with his newly acquired dagger, no questions asked, and in doing so turns every poor sod within a 20 mile radius into sand monsters. Except from himself, as he's protected by the dagger, Farah who's protected by the amulet of time, and the vizier who... Well, he's protected by some voodoo hoodoo staff of some kind that he's wailing about controlling the sands with. This is all really poorly explained in game to be honest. It's then that Jafar, it, I mean the vizier, has one last piss poor attempt to seize the dagger from the prince, who manages to escape his bony grasp and teams up with Farah to navigate through the palace of Azad and attempt to undo what he has done. For a 17 year old game the story is solid, but it's only really meant as an enticing setup, and then after that you're left to find your way up to the Tower of Dawn, where the vizier has had the hourglass taken, with no more story cutscenes appearing during the middle section of the game, we just get some plot advancements in the form of the prince daftly setting off Azad's defence system, killing his sand riddled father, and slowly falling in love with the Maharaja's daughter, who were at odds at the beginning of the game. Now this may sound like a lot when it's said like that, but due to the fact that it spreads so thin throughout 3 years of gameplay, that doesn't seem like all that much is happening for a huge section of the game. That isn't a bad thing though, as the journey itself through the treacherous, trap ridden environments is honestly where the most fun comes from. Eventually the Prince and Farah reach the hourglass, but old Princey is still unsure after several hours of bonding whether to trust Farah's words, as she has been the one desperate for him to undo his deed, so he hesitates, 
Just for a brief moment, but it gives our old pal the vizier the chance to appear at a thin air and ambush them, sending them down about 20 stories to a pitch black tomb, where they start revealing their feelings for each other as the player starts to question whether or not their game disc is broken. I'm guessing this kind of weird black cutscene was implemented to save on budget, and it does work effectively on focusing the player to listen to the conversation rather than observe what's going on, because he haws going on. So after a dreamy bathhouse sequence, the prince wakes up from his slumber to find Farah has disappeared with the dagger, intending to end this herself. Luckily for us, she's left her amulet behind so we don't get transformed into the sand. The prince manages to catch up with Farah at the top of the Tower of Dawn, but he's unable to save her from falling to her death as she has used up all the rewinds in the dagger. I mean, he does try his best to save her and ends up with his hands cut to ribbons before scornfully plunging the dagger of time into the hourglass and creating a grand rewind, bringing things back to the way they sat before the attack in the Maharaja's palace. Which I've never understood because the prince never had the dagger then. Surely it would rewind to the moment where he found it in the treasure vaults. But hey, time stories are a whole lot of what if, ands, and buts, so I'll go with that. Our story ends with the prince running up to Farah's room to warn her of the evil vizier, only to end up killing the daft old bastard in a piss poor end fight and returning the dagger back to Farah. It's revealed that the first person narrative we as the player have been hearing was the prince retelling the story to Farah, which is a neat touch and makes sense. Probably best that he didn't tell her about all his inner monologues though, as he comes off as a snivelling arse when he starts up all that shit. I'll meet you at the baths. She orders me around as if I were a servant. It's my own fault. With women, you need to show them you're in charge right from the start, or they'll walk all over you. Oh, have you been waiting here all this time? I didn't realize you meant these baths. I went to the other baths, clear across the other side of the city. She thinks that his story's a load of cock and bull, a fairy tale, but is left in two minds after a sly prince divulges the secret word she told him and only ever him that one time in the tomb. Just call me... Kakolukia. And they all lived happily ever after. Until some dev come up with the concept of the Dahaka anyway. As mentioned, the story itself is more of a setup and resolution to tie up the game nicely, and it's only briefly integrated within the midsection levels, instead letting the two main characters have time to bond and mature through clever gameplay mechanics, where they both rely on each other in order to work their way through Azad, and well, it works just perfect for a game like this. It gives ultimate freedom for the Prince and Farah to be in this long, epic feeling journey together. The pacing of the plot is honestly perfect, and that it's not at all intrusive in the game once it truly gets going, but it never falls too far into the background to halt any feeling of forward momentum. For a game that was released nearly 20 years ago, The Sands of Time looks excellent on all platforms it was originally released on. The footage you're seeing on screen is from the PC version and so looks especially great, but even when I played my pretty blurry PS2 version the other day, I was still impressed by the limited 480p visuals on offer. I will add that although the remastered version of the trilogy on PS3 has noticeably improved texture detail, aside from that, it looks pretty awful by the way, all three of them do, so pick that up at your own peril. The game is set in a slightly mythical version of Persia, and the visual style is a healthy mix of Arabian fantasy and darker, more brooding environments, which gives us a chance to venture through a wide range of varying vistas that all look pleasing to the eye. The environments themselves are spectacular looking, and I'll go into more detail on them later in the video, but there's also more subtle details spread throughout the game which are impressive, even to this day. Dirt and sand build up in the prince's white parachute pants as he dives around the palace, and when the player decides to stand still for an extended length of time, the prince will slowly begin to wipe his trousers and clean the dirt off. Nice. Another detail is that after the sands of time are unleashed, there are vibrant particles of sand swirling around on the ground, which give each environment a more dreamlike atmosphere, while also hammering home the emptiness of the world, as all the inhabitants have been consumed by the sands at this point. Other minor details include the prince leaving footprints on the ground after wading around in water, also he slips when trying to run up a wall after being in water as well, which is cool. There are also incredible ambient sound effects that loop over specific sections of the game. For instance, in the defence chamber there's an otherworldly hum. In the Sultan Zoo there's what sounds like creepy animal wheels in the distance. In 
and in the caverns, underground the palace, there's eerie dripping and the sounds of bats screeching all around you. The ambient audio loops really help sell each distinct environment just as well as the absorbing graphics. Music isn't exactly sparse throughout the game, but there are large segments where all we hear are the prince's movements and occasional grunts as he navigates the terrain. We're given silence when necessary to focus on tricky segments of platforming or try to figure out a puzzle, but when it comes to entering a room full of those bastard and sand monsters, the music blares. When combat begins there will always be an accompanying track, usually mixing elements of eastern percussion and vocals with more rock steady guitar riffs and it all gels together perfectly. The music gives each fight a sense of weight and purpose especially since each track only plays at specific points in the game, so it gives a quick sense of progression when a different combat song kicks in as you enter a new fight, you know you're moving on. It also helps the player match each song with a specific region in the game without even really having to think on it. For instance, I know this... is from the first couple of levels in a Zad around the bedchambers. This... from the royal bathhouse. This is from the prison and so on. The various music cues help each area you pass through feel different and even more memorable while never once sounding out of place within a Persian fantasy story. Probably the most important visual element of a 3D platformer are the in-game animations and with this game, man did they nail that. Everything the prince does looks so smooth and effortless. The animations and interactions are obviously limited due to the age of the game, but you can run, jump, somersault, grapple, swing onto poles, combat enemies, and string together a wide array of acrobatic performance stunts which still look and feel so fluid to this day. It's crystal clear that the first thing the developers figured out was all the crazy moves the prince could pull off and worked the environments around these skills carefully. The game's acrobatic party piece, so to speak, is the fact that the prince can run up and along walls to reach floors and podiums that would be impossible for many other video game characters. Even when he's locked in combat with a whole host of respawning enemies, all the acrobatic animations look incredible as he leaps around the place. The intricate animation of the sand creatures being absorbed into the prince's dagger may actually be my favourite visual of the game. It's really still a joy to behold and has stood the test of time without a doubt. The only negatives I have about the presentation is that even though the in-game dialogue is pretty much flawless in terms of writing and performance quality, sometimes the technical side of it holds it back somewhat. Volume levels can jump around sporadically to the point where it's actually a struggle to hear what someone's saying. I could marry her. After all, she is a Maharaja's daughter. A conquered one, but still, her blood is royal. But aside from that, um, the pre-rendered CGI cutscenes look pretty stiff and janky now. Character models and movements appear quite jarring in them. That's about all. Also their volume levels can be comically low at times. <laughs> you have to put the TV volume right up for that. My friend, my friend your visit brings joy and honour to my poor and humble dwelling. But that's about it. The game still looks and sounds as enchanting as ever, with even the usually bland kind of main menu and pause menu tying in certainly to the time travel narrative of the game. The in-game HUD is perfect in its design too. It's kept so simple as it's just your life bar and sand tanks you need to keep track of and when you're deep into a platforming section they will disappear so it never really feels visually intrusive at all. So good. Sands of Time is a third person action adventure platformer in which the gameplay is wrapped up in three neat packages that all effortlessly intertwine throughout the duration of the game. These are combat, action platforming and puzzle solving and it's probably best to go through them one by one to see how they each stand in their own merits. The combat on offer is where the game usually catches the most flack and that's understandable as the fighting abilities of the prince in this title are somewhat limited and with the enemies coming in mass hordes thick and fast it can get a little tiresome to keep executing the same couple of moves over and over. Technically speaking, there are a fair amount of movesets available, 
but no noticeable combos yet to speak of. Each fight mostly consists of hacking and blocking multiple enemies with a sword and finishing each monster off by absorbing their sandy existence into the dagger of time. The fast paced kicking, flipping and somersaulting all looks great on screen but you'll figure out quite quickly that most moves you'll never need to do and the best way to take down enemies is either to vault them or rebound from a nearby wall, downing them and leaving them open to your final dagger attack. To say it's a little shallow may be an understatement but it's still mostly enjoyable, mainly due to the variety of enemies that you encounter and powerful time manipulating moves that you can perform with the dagger like freezing monsters one by one or performing a massive multi-freeze. The monsters you face start off easy as it's just servants of the palace really but you soon come across far more demanding adversaries. There are large blue sand guards, chain wielding guards, huge hulking blacksmiths, meat hook warriors and toughest of all, sand generals. Those big bastards are a pain in the arse. As the game wears on, you do start to fight larger and larger packs of creatures and even though the combat is never too challenging, the fights in the courtyard and the elevator near the end can be strenuous to say the least, but this is in large part thanks to Farah, who tries her best to fight beside you but comes off more as a damsel in distress as her life bar depletes in front of your very eyes, that can be annoying. Most of the fun here comes from figuring out each monster's weakness and subsequently trying to exploit it in the next fight. Aside from the decent amount of transformed human foes, there are also sand bats, birds and scarabs that you come up against from time to time, but I would have to say these encounters may be the weakest and most annoying part of the game. The scarabs in truth get a pass, as you can easily chop away at them and even dodge past them at certain points, but the bats and birds are absolute shite. The bats all approach you at once when you're high up or walking in a tight ledge and you need to swipe away at them until there's only three or less remaining. Sounds easy enough, but it's damn near impossible to take them out without getting bitten to fuck. The vultures, or whatever they are, show up sporadically as well, and mainly just consist of you blocking until they attack, then striking them down, but getting timing right can be a bit of a chore. It's alright when you're on ground level, but there's this one section smack bang in the middle of the game, where they attack you one by one while you try to balance in a beam. Yeah, that part's woeful. One last thing worth noting about the enemies in this game, well the human ones anyway, is that they can also use the power of the sand, though not to the same extent you can, but they can teleport during battles, which gives off a sound effect that would burst your eardrums, as well as use the sand to resurrect themselves if you aren't quick enough to finish them off. It's a neat couple of additions that add to the fights, and the design of the enemies are certainly more striking and intimidating than most that appear in the next two games, but the combat system overall does leave a lot to be desired. It's just that the flaws are even somewhat magnified because most levels are overflowing with fight sequences. Onto the platforming now, and this is where the game really comes into its element. The prince controls brilliantly, even to this day. You feel that you have complete control of his abilities, and all the moves he can pull off seem logical within the context of the game world. He can jump from wall to wall, run walls, balance in narrow ledges, push crates, swing from ropes and horizontal bars, and climb ladders at a sensational speed. The greatest single element of the gameplay is undoubtedly the time manipulation powers that you gain from the dagger of time. The main hook being that the prince can rewind time back to a maximum of 10 seconds or so if you make a mistake or even fall to your death. Not exactly sure how he can click the dagger when he's dead, but it works. The fact that more than works, it's, it's an ingenious way to dismiss the need for checkpoints, as you will very rarely need them now thanks to the fact that you can undo your mistakes in a few seconds. It's masterfully implemented and somehow never comes across as cheap or cheating. Since most of the platform is trial and error, it feels only natural to rewind back after making a mistake because you've now figured out the way it must be done after making an arse of it in attempt number one. You can also temporarily slow down time, but honestly, I never used this at all in my last playthrough. The power becomes essential in future titles, but here it just seems kinda like a pointless addition. The controls for the most part are fully responsive, there's just a couple of times where you can't quite see the sweet spot to jump to because of the glitchy camera, so the rewind button is literally a lifesaver on those occasions. The dagger is fueled by the sands of time and contains sand tanks which can be filled by either finding sand clouds hidden all around the levels, 48 of them, or as mentioned earlier, killing off enemies and taking their sand. Sand is plentiful in the game so it's highly unlikely that you'll ever run out, but it's balanced out just perfectly so that you can't just keep spamming the rewind button to your heart's content, cause then you will eventually run dry. 
The death defying acrobatics themselves are my favourite element in the game and add up to some of the greatest platforming mechanics in gaming history. The outlandish moves just flow together so effortlessly and the prince feels weighty and responsive when he's using his momentum to swing from a pole 200 feet in the air even. For most of the game you'll enter a room at one side and have to get to the other by meticulously carving out a path with the help of Farah who can fit through small cracks in the wall and assist by standing on pressure plates and such. To be fair though we do nearly everything and she's essentially just there for company and so the character development can grow. Movements are precise and specific as you run past saw blades, dodge willing sabers and jump to avoid uh, giant wall pincers. Look, I don't know what the hell the something I was had was thinking about having these traps. I mean, why the hell would he install saw blades and pincers into his library for Christ's sake? Anyway, it's clear that the game was a pioneer in the action platforming genre, feeling like the precursor to games like Assassin's Creed and Uncharted, yet not feeling the least bit outdated when compared to them. It's fair to say that this is unquestionably the easiest game in the trilogy, mainly thanks to the fact that each time you enter a complex room requiring a bundle of platforming to get through, the camera will go into full Hollywood blockbuster mode and scan around the place, displaying exactly where you should be going. That's not a bad addition in the slightest, in fact I really do like that, but when it's coupled with the fact that your save points in the form of swirling sand clusters show you intricate visions of the future when you walk into them, it does become slightly overkill. It was only my most recent playthrough that I watched each and every vision and it did surprise me just how much the game holds your hand through many of the quote unquote trickier platforming segments of the game. Don't get me wrong, it's a neat artistic touch but I'm pretty glad that the future games get rid of the hand holding stuff. The game can be challenging at times but there's no steep difficulty curve or anything like that. There are even clear attempts to even out the difficulty towards the end of the journey as you eventually get an immensely powerful sword that can wipe out enemies with one strike but you no longer have the dagger to rewind your mistakes so ultimately combat becomes far easier but you need to take much more care with your platform. It works well. Last but not least we come on to the puzzles or should I say puzzle solving elements weaved into the platforming as there's only really two main puzzles in the game. The first one is where we meet what seems to be the sole survivor of this sandy apocalypse. Some guard with the fakest Cockney accent you've ever heard in your puff. Oh thank god! I was afraid you were one of them! Can you help me activate the Azad defence system? He resets a bunch of axles for us so we can match them up with the correct symbol and crank them back up again. It's a time consuming but ultimately easy puzzle as there's even a helpful diagram on the wall showing the route to each axle so it's damn near impossible to get stuck here. That said though I do find this one a bit of a slog. It's almost immediately recovered though by the guard's laughably camp yells as he's consumed by the sand. Legend. The second puzzle was like, what, four hours later and just includes lining up a bunch of mirrors in the correct position to beam light onto a symbol. Again, it's easy stuff, as we've dealt with mirrors and light beams earlier in the game. As stated earlier, there are loads more understated puzzles peppered throughout most levels, where we may need to stand in pressure plates or pull levers to move platforms. They're all serviceable and a welcome addition as they do get your brain thinking away briefly, but I wouldn't say they're the focal point of the gameplay, and they actually become sparser as the trilogy goes on, with usually one major puzzle per instalment. For around 95% or so of the adventure, the Prince and Farah are making their way in and around the Palace of Azad, so it would be forgivable with much of the surroundings starting to become visually monotonous as you plod along, but incredibly, this is far from the case actually. Sure, some levels may be similar in architecture, like the two sets of bathhouses and underground caverns, but each individual area has an atmosphere and art style all its own. Unlike other games in the series where many environments all seem to blend into one another and it's kinda easy to forget what comes next as you play through the story again, in Sands of Time it's genuinely easy to recall the chronology of the game as every single setting stands out. Some outdoor areas are wide open and simple to parkour around as are chiefly implemented to give a good flow to the platforming, but for every expansive environment that gives you room to breathe, there's a colossal enclosed puzzle of a place that's going to take some clever thinking in the player's part in order to get from A to B. As I said, there's swooping cinematic camera angles and pre-rendered visions available to help guide you through potentially complex sections, but even with their help, some of the more elaborate levels prove a worthy challenge in early playthroughs, but once you beat the game a good few times, it becomes less about figuring out what you have to do and more about remembering what you did last time you were here. There's always a perfectly arranged ledge or pole hiding in plain sight for you. It finds just the right balance, 
And even though the Prince only learns a few new moves as we advance, no two levels have a look or play the same. My personal favourite levels in the game have to be the Royal Baths, the Prison and the Library. These three in particular are burned into my memory and the first visuals I get in my head when someone mentions the game. Each of these environments have their own exclusive atmosphere that bring them to life. The baths look cosy and luxurious, except for the fact they're crawling with sand creatures. The library is a towering room of enchantment filled with mirrors and bookcases, while the prison feels so gritty and blood soaked. Hell, there's even a river of blood running underneath you as you enter a specific hallway. Easily the biggest switch of scenery from the usual colourful, charming surroundings, and a brief look in the direction the series would sharply head in. Aside from the atmosphere, these areas are wonderfully complex in design, having you string together loads of puzzle elements and polished platforming action continuously thanks to some first rate level design. These rooms and many more have you scaling multiple levels and then doubling back on yourself once you've somehow managed to reach a segment that was inaccessible before. It feels so satisfying when you can tilt the camera up or down and see just how far you've come. This is perhaps especially true in fact for your final ascent on the Tower of Dawn. Not all the levels are this great to play through of course though. Again, this mainly comes down to personal preference, but there are a few levels that I find uninspiring and that I can't wait to breeze past. There's a warehouse level early in the game that I've never been a fan of. It just consists of you and Farah sequentially pulling levers, moving platforms, so you can descend down to the ground floor for an almighty showdown. Eh. I mean, don't get me wrong, the warehouse does have a cool eerie feel to it, largely thanks to the ambient background sounds. but the level comes across a bit too empty for its own good. It doesn't actually help that the Sultan Zoo comes after it, because that's a level that I'm always up for returning to. My least favourite level in the game however is that high wire act with the sandbirds that I mentioned earlier. Honestly, come to think of it, the beam walking is the only aspect of platforming that I find irritating. It doesn't help when it's introduced to us in a level where we're trying to learn the ropes while constantly fighting off those winged bastards. You move at a snail's pace with your sword drawn. It's pretty much the only section of the game I would happily get rid of. Overall though, the derelict centre of Azad proves an entirely satisfying location for the Prince's first adventure. There are some areas that feel largely welcoming and others that make you just stop for a second and realise the crushing sense of isolation all around you due to the Prince acting like a loony and releasing the sands. The mystique of the palace is also enhanced by the 10 secret fountains you can find concealed within its walls. These strange ethereal sanctums act purely as health upgrades, but they're a welcomed inclusion as they're spread around most levels and keep you alert to your surroundings at all time. Any wall that looks the least bit decayed immediately deserves a swipe. Ok so just before I get into the final verdict, it's probably wise that I talk very briefly about the boss battles in Sansa time. There's two of them and they're fucking rank rotten. Ok, maybe I'm being a bit harsh as they aren't game breaking or anything, they're just painfully easy and don't stand out at all as there's zero platforming involved in either. The first boss is with your father of all people, in that same reception hall we had the battle like half an hour ago. It's pish. All you have to do is vault over him a dozen or so times and slash away until his 9 foot arse hits the deck like a sack of spuds. I mean the fight itself is pretty bad but there's also not much emotional weight to the battle either. A cutscene plays and then he's all but forgotten about until the two thrones I think. And then we have the final boss, isn't even worth going into detail on this one really. It's a sorry excuse for a challenge as we take on what appear to be constructed clones of the vizier in Farah's bedchamber before smacking the real decrepit old git right through her doorway. And since he's at death's door already we essentially show him mercy by putting him out of his misery. I do approve of the ending taking place in an all new environment but the battle itself is god awful. I don't think anyone who adores the game has a leg to stand on when it comes to defending the boss fights. They're far from its strong suit. Even though I may have ended the review in a somewhat sour note, the truth of the matter is, I love the hell out of this game. It does have a few rough edges and the combat could well have done with some fleshing out to stop it becoming so repetitive, but aside from that, the game's damn near a masterpiece and one of the most consistently enjoyable experiences to play through. The story's captivating, the world's charming and the gameplay mechanics hold up just about as well as possible considering this was 2003 after all. Thanks to its charming atmosphere and wholly satisfying environments, The Sands of Time is easily one of my favourite action adventure games of all time. It was a masterful achievement back in the day and it's still a must play game just now, that is if you just so happen to have a system to play it on. 
The game wraps everything up nicely and works fine and dandy as a standalone experience. But there's two more games to cover in the series, and only time will tell whether the next instalment retains a light-hearted charm that made the Sands of Time so appealing. Uh, you bitch! Hmm. Welcome back to Deja Review ladies and gentlemen. A couple of weeks ago I posted an incredibly random half hour video of Prince of Persia The Sands of Time just for the hell of it and well it's gotten some pretty decent views and positive feedback so it seems a worthy idea to work my way through the trilogy and give my two cents on each game as people like listening to opinions. This time round we'll be tackling the unmistakable black sheep of the pop franchise, Warrior Within. It's by far the most polarising entry in the series, with some calling it an incredible sequel that builds upon everything its predecessor brought to the table, while others say it threw everything that people loved about the Sands of Time out the window, replacing it with gratuitous violence and edginess. There seems to be no real middle ground with this one, and so I'll skip the tedious introduction stuff and get straight into my thoughts. Let's explore 2004's blood-soaked Prince of Persia, Warrior Within. The story picks up seven years after the events of the Sands of Time, where the Prince now finds himself endlessly hunted down by a colossal beast known as the Dahaka. We find out through the ramblings of an old wise man that the Dahaka is the guardian of the timeline, and so it's this thing's mission to ensure that the Prince meets his death because he idiotically opened the Sands of Time all those years ago. Pretty grim stuff, but luckily this fella's got an ace up his sleeve and tells the tale of the Island of Time where it's said that the Empress of Time first created the Sands, which the Prince opened in Azad. The story gets the Prince thinking, if he can journey to this fabled island and somehow stop the Sands from ever being created, then he could never have opened them, and the Dahaka will have no business hunting them down anymore. It's clear from the off that Warrior Within is much more plot heavy than its predecessor, and even after multiple playthroughs, it's quite hard to eat a brain wrapped around this convoluted setup. Moving on, a Prince sets sail for the Island of Time, although I've absolutely no idea how he knows where this mysterious place is. Anyway, he must have been on the right track, because an evil woman in black hole Shadi and a motley crew of sand monsters take over the Prince's ship and attempt to kill him. After a nasty confrontation, uh, you bitch! Shadi gets the better of the Prince and knocks him well and truly the fuck out. In a convenient stroke of luck though, the wreckage of his ship washes ashore in the island of time and he can get on with his quest, only difference being he now has no way off the island and his whole crew are stone dead. The prince soon catches up with Shadi and in an attempt to ruthlessly slaughter her steps into a time portal which transports them both hundreds of years into the past. It's worth noting that the old fella at the beginning also mentioned these things too, so the prince isn't taken completely off guard here. He ends up brutally killing this woman, and in turn saving a stranger called Kylina. The prince hopes that this woman can grant him an audience with the empress, but with that currently being an impossibility, Kylina instead tells him how to open the throne room door to where she resides, and this just isn't any old door opened by a simple key far from it. Instead, the prince must navigate his way through another trap-ridden fortress, activating two complex mechanisms on opposite ends of the island. If that wasn't bad enough, along his journey he has to repeatedly use time portals to travel between the past and the present, and run for his life against the Dahaka, who eventually discovers his whereabouts on the island. There's a hell of a lot going on in this story as you merely go from point A to point B. So finally, after activating the locks, the prince returns to the throne room, only to discover that this strange, strong-willed female who oddly resides on the island is actually the Empress of Time. What a shocker. Turns out that the Empress is on a quest to change her fate, much like the prince, as she is foreseen in the timeline that he kills her. A monumental showdown occurs between them both, but as foretold, our handy prince kills her. Well, actually destroys her as she curiously explodes into sand itself. The prince returns to the present and is ready to somehow go home, thinking all is well in the world, but the Dahaka hunts him still and forces him to reevaluate the whole situation. 
I'm guessing, thinking back on how the Empress burst into a cloud of sand, he comprehends that the sands of time must have been created from her remains, and so he still opened them in his ad, and the Dahaka still lost for his death to restore the timeline. Our poor old prince is in a right state when he miraculously stumbles upon supernatural hieroglyphics on the wall which tell the story of the Mask of the Wraith, a sacred artefact which allows the wearer to travel back into the past and exist in the same timeline as their former self. Truly trippy stuff. Anyway, the prince sees this as his last saving grace and ends up donning the mask, becoming the Sand Wraith itself. In doing so, he gets transported back several hours to when he first arrived on the island and runs a parallel course with his other self, even bumping into him on several occasions. The prince discovers there's a hidden portal behind the Empress's throne and formulates a plan to force her through this portal into the present with himself. This way, even if he must kill her, the Sands will be created seven years after the events of the previous game and so it wouldn't be possible for him to have released them. Now, this is where it gets a bit trickier as there's in fact two endings to this game. In the non-canon ending, the prince kills Kylina in the present and the Dahaka arrives one final time to take the sands of time in the form of her body and all the relics pertaining to it so that no fragments of the sands remain in the timeline. The prince then presumably builds a boat and sails home to see Babylon in the midst of a deadly war. In the secret but canon ending confusingly, the prince acquires a powerful water sword and takes on the Dahaka in the final battle instead of the Empress. After the Dahaka is defeated, the prince and Kylina build a boat together and journey home to the burning city of Babylon again. Only in this version, we get a sneak peek of the shadowy figure who looks to be behind this savage attack. But, I have to put up with this visual monstrosity sandwiched in amongst it, so it evens out. After saying all that out loud, I've come to realise that there's so much more going on in this adventure compared to the Sands of Time. Sure, we still have a steady number of hours just journeying around this seemingly massive island, but the plot of Warrior Within runs deep throughout the entire campaign. Whereas in the last game you had several hours of uninterrupted journey time, as the Prince and Farah got to know each other while simultaneously working together to reach the Tower of Dawn, here, there's nothing like that. The prince feels completely isolated in this monstrous fortress and stays focused solely on his mission, which is to undo his unbearable fate by killing a seemingly innocent person. It's all really dark stuff and the game usually gets criticised for it, but honestly, I love the story. Cutscenes are plentiful and you're constantly getting new objectives, so it never feels like you're chasing after the one goal for hours on end. It's clear that the developers didn't have this plot in mind when creating the previous game, but I think it was a right ballsy move to go down this path. The pacing of the game feels a tad more lopsided than before, but the plot threads hold themselves together considerably stronger as there's many intriguing things going on at once. There's layer upon layer of secrecy riddled throughout the story, and the stakes feel far higher than they ever did in the Sands of Time, thanks mainly to the Dahaka. It's brilliant. Now, it's this particular area of the game where it usually gets the most criticism thrown at it, and I've never quite understood all the hate. I think this is a fantastic looking game for 2004. It looks just as great, if not better, than the previous entry, and steps up texture and environmental details noticeably. It's easy to say that it looks visually ugly solely because it lacks the charm of Sands of Time, but the technical aspects are mostly superior. What those people really mean is that the game doesn't look the way they want it to. I often find that people who really hate this game are all massive fans of the Sands of Time, and probably didn't give Warrior Within much of a chance, because it strayed too far from what they loved about the prince's first adventure, and I can understand that. This used to actually be my least favourite game of the trilogy. I wasn't actually a fan of the grisly visuals, constant heavy metal riffs and greatly increased difficulty spike, but it was a game that I kept returning to for whatever reason. The more times I played through the story, the more I get used to the overwhelmingly dark aesthetic, the less linear structure of the environments and the seemingly endless lust for bloodshed, and now, quite frankly, I wouldn't change a single thing about the design. One element I can't dispute though is the fact that Warrior Within doesn't have quite as many diverse, eye-catching environments as its predecessor. The Arabian fantasy side of things is all but gone, and we're left with near constant dark brooding environments spread all over the island of time. Although the title of the game is still Prince of Persia, there's no real indication that this adventure takes place anywhere near a prince's kingdom. The island of time's look is a right royal hodgepodge of all sorts of different architectures, 
The outside of the fortress and certain specific areas look Eastern European in design, yet there are strange Egyptian looking hieroglyphics and crypts, hanging gardens reminiscent of Babylon, elaborate mechanical clockwork mechanisms and medieval looking torture chambers. There's very little that reminds us of our last adventure with the prince. It's a totally different world that we inhabit this time round, but it genuinely suits the mood of the story perfectly. The prince is a shadow of the pompous nobleman we encountered in the sands of time. Remember, he's been hunted by an unstoppable force for the best part of seven years due to his actions, it seems only fitting that he must travel through such a desolate ruined wasteland in order to undo his nightmare. The vistas do manage to visually separate themselves from one another though, largely thanks to the fact that we travel through most areas of the island in two different time zones. This primarily benefits the story, but it also keeps things nice and fresh for the player as well. In the present, all the surroundings lay shattered to pieces and consumed by mother nature. There's hardly a part of the fortress hanging together and a depressing grey filter over everything. When we try travel back to the past however, we get to see what the island looked like years ago before nature took over. The fortress is in one piece, there's a sombre yet alluring atmosphere encompassing everything and a golden brown filter instead of grey. Most areas we visit on the island are comparable through both time zones and it adds some warranted variety to the levels and an additional level of engagement as we get to see what the power of time has done to these once majestic structures. Like the sands of time, one of my very favourite elements of the game is the music and I don't necessarily mean the heavy rock riffs that blast out at every chance possible. What I'm mainly talking about are the ambient tracks that loop over specific areas. There are far more of them this time round and they are invaluable when it comes to laying on the eerie atmosphere that surrounds the prince. Some of the best examples are the creepy track that plays after you defeat Shadi on the sacrificial altar. The strange rhythm that starts when you enter the garden tower. And my personal favourite, the truly mysterious vocal track that starts when you're in the foundry. That one creeps me out even to this day when I'm playing that section late at night, which means it works exceedingly well at heightening the harrowing mood of desolation. On the other end we have the rock riffs which blare whenever you get stuck into some combat or have to run for your life as the Dahaka ominously hunts you down. Some of these work better than others. I do find the Godsmack instrumentals to be a bit of a grind after a while, even though they can enhance the chase segments. It just becomes a bit gratuitous when even the end credits are scrolling to the sound of one of their songs. All a bit too much for me. Some of the actual combat music created for the game though is outstanding and helps ramp up the intensity when you're taking down never ending hordes of monsters. The track that blares in the prison is especially effective and without doubt my favourite song from the game. Well, it's my favourite bar in the main menu music because that's timeless. Things are pretty much faultless when it comes to Warrior Within's in-game animations. Aside from some new insane looking combos during fights, the Prince keeps almost the exact same moveset that he had from the previous game and the acrobatic manoeuvres look even more impressive than before. Animation wise, this is very familiar territory as the Prince runs and vaults identically to Sands of Time, but his overall appearance and attitude have sure been given a murky makeover. The Prince now looks like a battle hardened warrior with longer jet black hair, spouting disparaging remarks as he annihilates hordes of of enemies. It's a jarring change no doubt, but makes sense when you stop to consider the years of constant turmoil he's implied to have gone through. His change of demeanour is driven home when he curses at a couple of enemies who stand in the way of his mission. Thankfully these almost overwhelmingly aesthetic changes don't make their way into the gameplay side of things. I won't go over the core gameplay mechanics that are practically identical to the Sands of Time. Instead I'll go through combat, action platforming and puzzle solving to see what's new in this entry and whether everything works or not. Let's face it, the only element of Sands of Time that really held it back was the overly repetitive combat system. It worked well enough for that game, but it was clearly an area that the developers would have to flesh out for Warrior Within, and holy shit did they flesh it out. Quite honestly, the combat went from being my least favourite gameplay element to my favourite this time round. With this 
this game Ubisoft introduced the freeform fighting system and advertised it heavily in pre-release trailers, so I'm guessing they knew they were onto a winner here. Everything about this new system feels insanely better than the jump, swipe, finish off routine we had to go through with every single sand creature before. Here, you can string together limitless amounts of crazy combos, dual wield weapons, throw projectiles, grapple and throw enemies, decapitate them, choke them out, shred them in half. It's glorious. It feels like a kind of precursor to the Batman free flow fighting system, but with more acrobatics and gore. Unlike the last game where you had to find an enemy's weakness and try to repeatedly exploit it in each fight, here you rock up to a group of monsters and can choose to take them down any way you feel like. Even walls and poles can be used as interactive objects to give the prince a couple of extra moves in times of need. I can't actually think of a single complaint with the combat mechanics on offer, but the enemies you face off against aren't quite as impressive as what you can do to them. There are a fair amount of foes that you come across on the island, but they don't seem half as imposing as the hulking sand zombies we came across in Azad. These creatures look much more humanoid in appearance, being about the same height as the prince and moving at a much faster speed than anything we've seen in the last game. We still have the same formula for the enemy encounters though, taking on simple raiders through the earlier levels, moving on to the trickier seekers in the mid levels and eventually coming up against the challenging executioners and assassins near the end. This does play out well as it helps you get used to the new combat system as you take down easier enemies on the island first, because once you come up against the latter hordes, you're going to need just about every combo you can remember in order to take them down without suffering massively. There are also a couple of mini bosses we come across, who predominantly reside in the garden and mechanical towers. These come in the form of a crow master, who dissipates after a few strikes and rematerializes in another podium, and a few giant golems that require you to vault on their back in order to chip away at their noggin armor and cleave right through their skulls. They're all good, and aside from them, the game does try and shake things up a bit in the form of highly aggressive dog, wolf, sand creature things. I'm not exactly sure what these four-legged fiends are meant to be, but they come in two forms anyway. There are the common spike beasts, which act erratically and explode into a ball of fire when they reach their end, and scavengers, which only appear in the last third of the game. These fuckers seem far more powerful than their spiky brethren, and leap huge distances to tear the prince apart. Both of these enemy types are pests of hell, but they're still a welcomed addition compared to those blasted birds and bats from before, as at least these beasts can be taken out on the ground. Since the prince has Farah's amulet of time instead of the dagger for this adventure, there's no requirement for us to suck the life out of all these enemies for a finisher move. The human foes all show damage now, and eventually turn a sandy colour when they're just a few hits away from death. This is a great addition, it lets you know just how close you are to taking down each monster, meaning you can neatly set off an elaborate combo to take 3 or 4 of them out at once. Also, the developers must have realised that sometimes the fights can get a little too much, and so helpfully laid out nearby traps that you can use to kill off a few enemies at a time. The last thing I want to mention about the combat are the new sand powers that you can use to your advantage. You can't exactly freeze a whole group of creatures at once anymore, but you can use ravages of time to move through time at a blinding speed and take down several enemies simultaneously. We can also slow down time properly now, meaning that the prince is unaffected and can perform more effective attacks on stagnant enemies. Last Lastly we come to the ground attacks, which are 360 degree blasts that knock a multitude of enemies away from the prince. These come in three different versions, all varying in strength, but as always, the stronger the melee attack, the more sand tanks it will drain. Aside from the powers, you also gain upgraded swords as the game progresses, meaning that enemies should theoretically start to pose less threat as the weapon you wield is far more powerful in the second half of the game. It doesn't exactly play out like this though, as some of the later fights are undeniably a pain in the arse. Onto the platforming now, and everything feels like business as usual here. I think this was simply a case of, if it's not broke, don't fix it, and in all honesty, that works out just perfectly. The prince can still perform his large array of acrobatic stunts to traverse the environment wonderfully. Only a few new moves have been added, such as running along vertical ropes, slicing down the island's tapestries, and running up walls to pull mechanisms of sort, and they're all seamlessly incorporated into his already vast moveset, and never come across as shoehorned additions. The power to rewind time is still the biggest hook of the game, and you'll get far more use of this handy power on this adventure, I can assure you. A great new inclusion this time round is the Eye of the Storm, which I just briefly spoke about in relation to the combat. This lets you travel around for 10 seconds at normal speed, while everything around you is put into slow motion. It makes far more sense than its wonky inclusion in the sands of time, as this time the power becomes essential to avoid traps, fight enemies and get through certain doors that would be an impossibility in normal time. 
Again the amulet is fueled by the sands of time, but this time there's no sand clouds hidden in the island. Instead sand is stored in breakable objects and the creatures you fight again. Let's get it right, this is without doubt the most difficult game in the trilogy. Gone are the pre-rendered cutscenes which help you foresee the path you should be taking. Only sometimes will the camera scan around the place as you enter a new room, and even then, that's toned down dramatically, only showing you where you need to go, but not leaking any clues as to how to find your way there. I didn't appreciate the added difficulty when I was younger, but playing it through now, I much prefer this bare bones approach to the platforming. If you're not careful, it's extremely simple to get lost or not understand how to pass through a certain area, but it ends up feeling more rewarding when you discover the path all by yourself and gradually gain knowledge of how every level is laid out. Even the traps this time round seem like they've been cranked up to 11. There's hardly a nook or cranny you explore that doesn't have some piece of gruesome machinery set out to massacre the prince. Many traps return from the last game, but we do have some new troublesome devices that demand much more patience from the player. We now have horizontal spiky poles, delayed spike mechanisms and giant stone pillar things that can squash you to a pulp if you're not careful. It's not just the traps themselves that are harder, but the layouts become more complex in the later levels, meaning you're going to have to slow down time a bunch to forge your path through them. It's worth mentioning that this game will take you a good 2-3 to three hours longer to complete in the sands of time. There's a lot of gameplay in here and a fair amount of different areas in the map to explore, but thankfully things never get boring thanks to the introduction of the sand wraith about 3 quarters of the way through the story. When you do eventually don the mask of the wraith, you go through a traumatising physical transformation which welds the mask to the prince's face and distorts him into a spectral doppelganger, allowing him to occupy two spaces in the one timeline. We play as a wraith until the prince's other self perishes and it really spices things up in the back half of the game. Aside from the cool new look, we also get some key changes to the gameplay as your sands of time regenerate while your life slowly fades away. This subtle difference actually contributes a great deal to the remaining couple of hours of gameplay as the difficulty level cranks up tremendously in terms of platforming, allowing you to take advantage of the countless sand tanks as you fail parts again and again. And it's balanced out nicely by the fact that your constantly depleting life bar will have you attentively dodging every single trap and enemy attacks to make sure that you take as little extra damage as possible. The sand race section might actually be my favourite of the game, the more I come to think on it. It does keep things so fresh all throughout the final stretch of the story, and of course we've seen the sand wraith creature earlier, but thought of it as an adversary instead of an ally. It's all compelling stuff when we play as a wraith and interact with the prince's other self multiple times. Last, but certainly not least, are the Dahaka set pieces spread throughout the game. The Dahaka itself is an outstanding creation, and the main antagonist of the game, yet the developers knew that showing him too often would ruin the scare factor it possesses. The Dahaka catches up with the prince throughout his journey, which results in a dozen or so incredibly tense chase sequences where we need to outrun this force of nature by platforming the shit out of the environment. We discover quite early on that the Dahaka's sole weakness is what gives our prince strength, water, and so every chase comprises of us running for our lives until we reach a place of safety behind water where the beast cannot pass. They're legit thrilling sequences that get much better each time they show up and act as an immediate step to raise your pulse and platform like your life depends on it. Ok so I've probably spoken far too much about the platforming, so I'm quite glad that there's actually hardly any puzzles to speak of in Moria within. Again, like Sands of Time, there's puzzle solving elements interlaced all through the game in the form of pulling levers and figuring out how to traverse tricky sections in the environment, but these are to be expected as they merge in so smoothly with the other gameplay elements. The only outright puzzle to speak of are the magma pipes that you must line up in order to melt down a platform for you. I've always found this puzzle to be a bit of a pain in the arse. I'm sure there's a simple order to do it so that you're only turning a few pipes and that's it by with, but I always end up messing around in this foundry for 10 minutes trying to figure it out. Again, it's far from a difficult puzzle and even my lousy style of trial and error gets it out of the way quite promptly, but it's just so strange that it's the only puzzle room in the game and sticks out like a sore thumb compared to the rest of the four environment. I used to always forget that this was even in the game to be honest. Right, so I've basically done nothing but praise Warrior Within for the best part of the last half hour, so it's only right to point out some of the flaws that it's got going against it now. To start, no matter how much I love the setting of the Island of Time, and let's get it right, I do think it's superb. Even I have to concede that the backtracking present throughout just about all of the game can become almost unbearable at times. Just to be clear, I am a big fan of the far less linear open world style of the map that we're going for here, and the environments for the most part are spectacular to roam around for the first couple of times. 
There's a few minor areas such as the beach at the beginning, or the cliffside, the aforementioned foundry room and the mystic caves near the end that all feel particularly special within the world and the reason for this is simply that we only visit these areas once and so they never get a chance to become stale. Places like the Mechanical Tower and the Creepy Prison are without doubt some of the greatest levels in the game, with the coolest architecture and platforming resources, but the truth is that we've passed through them so many times in the back half of the game that we start to question whether we're even going the right way half the time. I wouldn't like even estimate how many times I've completed Warrior Within, but even in my last playthrough there, there was a brief moment that had me questioning myself as I took the same path back from the clockwork room for the third time. I was sure I'd take a wrong turn somewhere down the line. Just remember actually my pal Christopher, who's no stranger to this game, took a wrong turn once while looking for a life upgrade I think, and ended up being stuck in the wrong room with no exit in sight. There was no way back. <laughs> it's easily done, and I imagine on a first playthrough it could make a break the experience for the player. And that's about it. <laughs> that's about all the negatives I really have for the level design in truth. The course you're meant to take can be blurry at times, but the actual levels you pass through are artistically astonishing and a real joy to behold. As I mentioned earlier, a good chunk of the environments are immensely dark and grimy, but they're still remarkably detailed in design, more so than in the sands of time actually. The moderately open world is great at bringing a sense of cohesiveness to all the different places scattered throughout the island, as they all link together through massive entrances and the central hall, or alternatively secret passages that you discover more and more towards the end of the tale. Revisiting the same old places can be a chore, but thankfully it's never an identical experience, as a cutscene will trigger or a dahaka pursuit will start up just as you ponder how many times you've crawled along this ledge. If you're going the right way, you'll find out soon enough, and you'll only be venturing through a repeated environment for a short length of time before you're thrust into an all new place tucked away within the depths of the fortress. There are genuinely no single levels that I can think of off the top of my head that I dislike in Warrior Within. From start to finish, the locales that you advance through are insanely absorbing. The oppressive atmosphere that's a failing to some works wonders in showing just how isolated the prince is in his journey, roaming this creepy ravaged fortress through two time zones and facing all manner of sand infested monsters. And there's no denying that it's a lonely journey this time round, with very little character development possible, as every character the prince meets ends up having to die from his blade. I'll quickly go over a couple of my favourite areas in the game that routinely stand out to me as being the high points of the adventure. The Garden Tower is the one true remainder of life in the island, and one of the most visually satisfying areas that you parkour through, no doubt. In the present, it's an overgrown wilderness where vines and tree stumps can be utilised by the prince's makeshift podiums as he makes his way through the lush labyrinth. Back in the past though, the garden looked the part, with glistening blooms of light bursting through the trees and enchanting vegetation surrounding all the rooms. It's a brief glimpse of what this now haunting palace used to look like, and a warranted change of vista compared to the usual industrial hell we're used to. My absolute favourite level in the game though are the mystic caves that you come across near the end while being chased by the Dahaka. These ghostly caverns are covered with a thick layer of fog which cause you to have real difficulty manoeuvring through. It's an otherworldly realm that seems oddly detached from the rest of the fortress, as it's like nothing else we come across in our journey. Its placement in the journey also helps out greatly, as it comes after a huge segment of backtracking. It's a breath of fresh air when an all new striking area like this appears out of nowhere. Another great thing about the island of time is how mysterious the whole place feels. It's like a sanctuary to all these monsters who dwell within, and possesses an overwhelmingly eerie atmosphere from the first second you step foot there. The secrets to be discovered in this game are plentiful compared to the last, as there's artwork chests, secondary weapons and life upgrades all hidden deep in the island, and I mean hidden. Some of these collectibles are easy to come by on your linear path, but others are in discreet areas that you would never think of venturing to. A few are hidden behind cracked walls that you cannot get through the first time you pass the area, and so must backtrack there after acquiring the scorpion sword, because it can break through walls. There's one life upgrade in particular though, that is hidden deep within an early section of the game, that you would never even dream of returning to, had you not watched a helpful video on YouTube. It's batshit crazy how far out of the way it's concealed, but you have to admit it all feels worthwhile when you finally reach it and get your reward in the form of the water sword. And on that note, let's round things off by going over the bosses. If you remember, I ripped apart the boss fights last time round, and rightly so, they were utter shite in the sands of time, but thankfully, yet again, Warrior Within mends just about all the problems and churns out four pretty damn satisfying boss fights. Well, I say four. There's actually five if you count the alternative ending with the Dahaka, which conveniently 
conveniently, it can only be accessed if you find all the health upgrades and possess the water sword. The boss battles aren't exactly stellar here, as they almost entirely consist of combat mechanics yet again, but they're varying and challenging enough to hold their own in a game packed with brilliance. They're more typical of what you would expect, as a giant health bar appears at the bottom of the screen and you try every trick in the book to take out each opposing enemy. The first two battles against Shadi and the Empress are straightforward enough, and then there's a random battle with a giant sand griffin that comes right out of left field. No idea if this thing was a guardian of the Empress or just a transformed creature that dwells in the island, but it's a terrific change of pace. Your final battle has you taken off against either a far stronger version of the Empress or the almighty Dahaka itself. I definitely prefer the latter as it's a much tougher challenge but also feels merited. Facing off against this seemingly invincible beast that's been hunting you for years and taking it down with a legendary sword, it just sounds right. It's just a pity that in this ending you end up shacked up with Kylina once all was said and done. A lot of shit. I would have preferred it if the Dahaka erased her from the timeline before your showdown as it would have added even more extra weight to the confrontation but hey ho, I'm just nitpicking now. Okay, so yeah, if you can't tell, I truly love Warrior Within. In my last review, I called Sands of Time damn near a masterpiece, and well, I would take it one step further this time and say that Warrior Within is one. The overly dark and edgy direction they took things has never bothered me in the slightest, and only stands to elevate the experience for me. Even the different choice of voice actors seems to suit the pitch black tone of the game just perfectly. When a man is faced with his own death, he finds the impossible less of a barrier. To me it's an even richer adventure than its predecessor, with a largely interconnected world to explore, massively improved combat, more hidden secrets and a noticeably longer story. Even the graphics on offer here are again outstanding for 2004, and the gameplay mechanics hold up just about flawlessly in every single aspect. The charming atmosphere may be replaced with one of dread and despair, but the game is no less enjoyable to play through, quite the contrary. The level design is still as razor sharp as ever, and there's more to sink your teeth into plot wise this time round. I can completely understand why some people were initially put off by the attitude of this game, but I would wholeheartedly still recommend this game to anybody now, even if it is 16 years old and only available on outdated systems. Backtracking aside, I would say that this is an incredibly ballsy follow up to the much adored Sands of Time, and one of my personal favourite games of all time. Just need to wait and see if the trilogy gets closed out with the same intense quality after Warrior Within receives such an initial backlash. Join me next time as I take on the final piece in the puzzle, the Two Thrones. Welcome back once again to Deja Review, where today I conclude my set of retrospective reviews on the Prince of Persia trilogy by discussing the final game in the series, The Two Thrones. Both The Sands of Time and Warrior Within were extremely innovative and original games at the time of their release, and I imagine it was a huge strain on the developers to keep the games moving forward in an inventive manner, given that each of the games only had a one year development cycle. I haven't gone into much detail about the development of each title, instead focusing mainly on what we got with the final product. But just before we get started with this one, it's probably wise to go over a glaring issue. The Sands of Time was universally adored when it hit the shelves in 2003, but Warrior Within seemed to split the fans right down the middle. Some players appreciated the darker tone, gruesome visuals and more complex tale of the narrative, but there's no denying that the jolting chains of aesthetics unsettled many fans of the series. Ubisoft took a huge gamble with Warrior Within, and I'm certain that they intended to finish the series off with the same oppressive tone that loomed over that game, but about halfway through developing Two Thrones they seemed to change their mind. Early gameplay trailers and preview footage shows an entirely different beast from what we ended up with. It appeared to keep all the blood and gore from its predecessor, as it had the prince leap across the overcast city of Babylon, shredding his enemies to pieces once again, as well as burning himself in fire to change into his alter ego. Of course, much of the final game was extremely similar to those early previews, but it's clear that the developers toned down the violence dramatically, taking away the dark edge that Warrior Within owned, and instead hastily trying to force things back to the way they looked in the sands of time. They even changed the name of the game, as it was originally expected to be titled Kindred Blades, 
which is a damn shame because that's a great name. But anyway, enough about what could have been, let's get into my thoughts and what we ended up with. Let's explore 2005's brilliant identity crisis, Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones. The Two Thrones promptly picks up a few weeks after the events of Warrior Within, well, the canon events anyway. The developers must have realised that most people would have missed out on the special ending of the last game, and so added in a handy wee retcon that changes their perceptions of what happened. I remember when I first played the game in fact and seen the opening, I had no idea what the hell was going on and kept wondering to myself why they'd changed the whole story. Silly bastard that I was. Anyway, here we start with the Dahaka finally defeated, the Prince and Kylina return to Babylon only to find that it's in the midst of a devastating war. The Prince has obviously forgotten that all the events of the Sands of Time have now been wiped from existence, so the Maharaja never found the mystical hourglass on the island of time, and the Vizier is still very much alive and desperate to find a way to become immortal again. It's made out that the Vizier accompanied the Maharaja on his trip and learned that the Empress of Time could grant him eternal life. So he's travelled to Babylon, ravaged the war, and happily awaits the prince's arrival back to his kingdom. So anyhow, the prince's boat gets destroyed yet again as he enters the harbour, and the empress is captured by a couple of the vizier's guards. The prince makes his way through the ruined city streets and eventually catches up with Kylina's abductors in his father's royal palace. It's here that we once again come face to face with that evil old bastard, although he doesn't look half as old and sickly this time round. Quite a cool wee detail was that the vizier has never met our prince before because the timeline has been wiped, so he doesn't really think much of us, whereas the vizier is basically the prince's mortal enemy by this point. He doesn't stay mortal for much longer though as he immediately kills the empress and releases the sands of time once more, infecting most of Babylon and his Scythian army. The vizier then goes on to stab himself with a dagger of time and transforms into... Eh... Uh, Listen, I've never been able to figure out what this big amber exoskeleton is actually meant to be. It's like half crab, half butterfly. But yeah, he gains immortality as our prince gets a sand infested dagger tail fused into his arm. Luckily he manages to acquire his old pal, the dagger of time, before the sand corrupts him entirely and plummets about 5,000 feet down a sheer cliff. Much of the story from here on out consists of the prince making his way through all the different sections of Babylon to once again kill the vizier at the top of a tower. This time it has to be with the dagger itself as it's the only artifact that can abolish his immortality. As the prince journeys on, he soon realises that the infection from the sands have greatly affected his body and mind, creating an alter ego, appropriately called the Dark Prince. The Dark Prince constantly talks and taunts to the prince as he nears his goal. I can only imagine what the vizier is doing. Probably expanding his army, torturing innocent citizens, deciding what kingdom to conquer next. What he should be doing is dying. I have not forgotten my mission. Could have fooled me. And finds a way to completely take over his mind at certain intervals, temporarily transforming him into a hybrid sand monster with heightened abilities. This B plot, so to speak, is honestly the main hook of the game as it's captivating to witness this arrogant and sarcastic inner voice start to alter the prince's state of mind. While advancing through Babylon, we encounter our old ally, Farah, who has no knowledge of the prince and initially seems quite concerned by the fact that we know her name and official title. Before long, they team up again though, as she begins to act as a voice of reason who pulls the prince away from the cruel grasp of his alter ego and reminds him that it's not just about ending the vizier's life but helping all the suffering citizens of the kingdom. After a long journey through Babylon, the vizier finally makes an appearance out of thin air in the Hanging Gardens, capturing Farah and plunging the prince down into an ancient well. It's at this crucial point in the game that the Dark Prince almost permanently takes over, as the prince transforms mid-fall and cannot source out any water to help him return to his normal form. The takeover is just about complete when the prince stumbles upon his father's dead body Body, laying alone at the bottom of this well. It's totally unclear why King Sharaman was trapped down a pitch black vault. Either the vizier trapped him down here and slaughtered him, or he's just wandered in here, fell asleep and died. Either way, it's a key moment in the story as the prince eventually comes to accept his fate, refusing to battle against the consequences of his actions any longer, and vanquishing the dark prince from his soul altogether. The prince then journeys onwards and upwards until he reaches the top of the Tower of Babylon and confronts this hideous looking vizier, who's now titled himself Zor. Zorvan, I think, as he thinks himself as a god. He ends up getting the better of this old prick once again, slaying him with a dagger and releasing the sands from his body. Farah is subsequently set free and the people of Babylon rejoice, or what's left of them. The prince must lastly go through a surreal mental realm to destroy his dark alter ego once and for all. Thanks to Farah, he 
manages to escape this place of evil, and the story ends, once again, with the prince telling Farah all about his tale, and so starting the whole story of the trilogy over again. Look, I have problems with elements of the story, but this ending is deeply effective, and the perfect way to complete this time travelling story. The story of the Two Thrones does feel like a light retread of the Sands of Time, but with a few crucial changes that stop it from getting boring. Like before, we're back in a more classic Persian setting, possess the Dagger of Time, journey with Farah, have to deal with the passing of our father and take down the big bad vizier at the end of it all. It does feel like highly familiar territory, just with the stakes raised somewhat. It's far from a carbon copy of the first game though, as it plays out more like a what if scenario, as this time the vizier has gained immortality and near destroyed the prince's own hometown. It all feels much grander than anything from the sands of time, largely thanks to the fact that you're travelling through a full city instead of an isolated palace, trying to save anyone that you come across. The biggest and best switch up is by far the inclusion of the Dark Prince in this adventure. Although we have Farah back on our side for large portions of the journey, the persistence of this inner voice and physical transformation helps stop things from ever feeling too comparable to anything we've gone through before. I think I'm going to be sick. It feels like the Dark Prince is almost a self-referential addition by the developers, as he comes across as a schizophrenic embodiment of the two different shades of our prince, split between the innocent charming nobleman of the Sands of Time and the focused battle-hardened warrior from Warrior Within. Because we have observed most of the plot beats from this story before, it would be fair to say that it is possibly the weakest in the trilogy in terms of engagement, but there can also be no denying that the internal strife conveyed within the prince's mind comes off as one of the most compelling narratives in the series. Yet again, The Two Thrones looks mostly spectacular on all platforms, especially given its age. The game has done away with the constant dark and dreary environments, instead replacing them with an array of more vibrant cityscapes and luscious gardens where the colours shine right off the screen. As I've mentioned before, it does tend to remind you of the Sands of Time more than Warrior Within, swaying back to the more dynamic colour palette and capturing the feeling of ancient Persia perfectly. Babylon was the obvious location to end the prince's adventure and it truly looks apart throughout large portions of this game. The rooftops look unbelievably expansive, the city streets lay demolished and infested with evil monsters, and the palaces we enter are marvels in terms of architecture. It's obvious that the aim was to make this the most grandiose adventure of the lot, by giving the player the freedom of an entire ravaged city to explore, and it does the job successfully, for the most part. It is hard to deny that many sections of this game all seem to merge into each other thanks to the surroundings appearing a bit, well, bland at times. I'll go on to discuss the specifics about level design later, but for every area that catches your eye and lives long in the memory, there's one that just looks like a mundane street or corridor tucked away within a dingy city. Perhaps I'm being harsh here, as these areas aren't exactly a dime a dozen, but they do tend to appear frequently enough that you're wishing the game would hurry up and get you to the next big spacious area that you can get platforming around. On my last playthrough there I noticed just how much of the first third of the game all blends into one another because most of the surroundings look pretty much identical. It doesn't help that there's a slightly murky golden hue over all the outdoor environments that doesn't have the same attractive allure as the Sands of Time. The game could have maybe utilised a different distinctive look when we transform into the Dark Prince perhaps to give us a visual contrast, maybe make use of a darker filter or increase the contrast to help these little segments stand out more in terms of appearance. The final thing I'll mention here is also that the in-game character models seem to look a bit off this time round, with Farah and the Prince's hair constantly cropping through their face in cutscenes and the Vizier looks like one hot fucking mess. I already feel like I'm picking in the game a bit now, but I'm going to have to get tore into the audio side of things as well while we're at it. I promise I do love this game, so the positives are on their way. Previously, the music was incredibly fitting throughout both games, with the Sands of Time going for a healthy mix of Arabian and classy rock riffs, while Warrior Within leaned more heavily towards blaring metal screeches and creepy ambient loops. Both worked absolute wonders in emphasising their atmospheres respectively and ramping up the sense of adrenaline when the prince was locked in combat. In The Two Thrones, the music's okay, but I would struggle to say that it's anything more than that. Some of the early fight tracks stick in your memory, but that's primarily because they're playing so often. Probably my favourite track is this palace battle music. <laughs> That's actually the only outstanding song and a soundtrack that just doesn't stand out much at all, at least when comparing it to what the previous two titles had to offer. Effective ambient music does appear in certain more mysterious levels in the game like the sewers.
Anything else just seems to disguise itself as background noise and gets lost in the sounds of citizen screams from below, but that works just fine so I've no real complaints there. Thankfully, the in-game animations are as faultless as ever as the prince's moveset remains intact. He can perform just about every single action from Warrior Within, but overall just seems wildly more agile on this adventure. It's a given by now that he can do all the wall running, pole swinging and acrobatics that he's renowned for, but this time round the prince has got a whole load of new insane looking moves in his arsenal. Every new acrobatic manoeuvre fuses in so smoothly with his previous bag of tricks and you get used to all the new possibilities so quickly that it immediately looks natural to be stealthily sliding down chains and shimmying down tight spaces. You soon forget that these actions weren't even available in his previous outing. The prince also looks back to his normal self appearance wise and no longer shouts in a fit of rage every time he takes down an enemy. They did a superb job of merging his two different identities from the last games and passing him off now as someone who's soaked up all the bloodshed of the past seven years, but still retains parts of the graceful, light-hearted nature he started off with. Just like last time, I've split the gameplay into three separate categories, as we see what's new with the combat, action platforming and puzzle solving, and discuss whether the new additions were warranted. The core combat won't take all that long to discuss anyway, because it's damn near identical to what we had in Warrior Within, and I'm just fine with that. The freeform fighting system was a bloody glorious way of taking down your enemies, and it's only right that it made its return here. Only problem is, it doesn't feel as satisfying in this game as it did before, for a couple of important reasons. First of all, the developers must have realised that if they toned down the dark aesthetic they originally had planned for the game, then it was only wise to tone down the notoriously violent combat system as well. I can easily understand the reasoning behind this, but it just sucks a great deal of fun out of slaughtering enemies in the coolest way possible. A couple of the most brutal combat moves such as choking and slicing enemies in half have been removed altogether and the other finishers just don't pack the same punch anymore either. The creatures no longer scream in pain, heads no longer fly off and blood doesn't spew out of them when they're taken down. I get that this all seems like relatively trivial stuff as an impressive combat system still remains but trust me, it makes a big difference. The second reason is simply because the sand creatures you face off against are much trickier to defeat. The monsters in the island of time regularly proved a challenge but they always gave you ample room to start off a combo and take a handful of them out at once. You'd be the luckiest person alive if you can get a chance to do that in the two thrones. Your adversaries are constantly blocking all of your combos and seem much more aggressive in their fighting style. Just about all the enemies you come up against here seem extremely humanoid in appearance once again, and range from the rather mundane Scythian guards and archers, to creepy dark reptus creatures who can't stand the light, and female enchantresses who dance their way out of harm. There's quite a few different enemy types thrown in here which is always good to see, but no real difficulty curve to them. This time just about all the enemy encounters usually end up being a pain in the arse and costing you a huge chunk of your health bar. Worst of all are the new four legged beasts called Hunter Hounds, which appear out of nowhere and suck all your sand tanks away before you can put them out of their misery. Ah, nah, I don't approve of these greedy bastards at all. Luckily, the combat isn't just as straightforward as some harder enemy types in a toned down freeform system. The game saving grace once again is the Dark Prince and his legendary dagger tail weapon. I'm not going to lie, most of the combos with the Dark Prince slowly transform into some form of button mashing to see what sticks, but just about everything does stick. Enemies don't have a hope in hell of avoiding this weapon, as it's far more effective than the Dagger of Time. The Prince will swing and whip the weapon in just about every direction, pull enemies towards him, circle it above his head to buy him time, and stealthily strangle his victims to death. It feels endlessly more powerful wielding this unique weapon, but the good thing is, if you're not a fan of this more visceral fighting style, you can still utilise the Dagger of Time as a primary weapon. One huge gameplay inclusion which made its debut here was the introduction of stealth speed kills. Essentially, these are short quick time events which require you to press the action button just as the dagger illuminates in order to take down one or two enemies in quick succession. A lot of people seem to have a problem with this new mechanic but I thought it was a neat addition that meant you could skip over some fighting sections and get straight to the next round of platforming. I get that it can be a bit overpowered at times, but it's routinely fun to see if you can silently take down a whole bunch of monsters instead of getting involved in an all out brawl. A lot of the environments above the creatures are cleverly set out for you to test the waters with this new mechanic and get into the perfect position to launch an attack. The best thing again is, you don't need to abide by them. If you want to just get tore into endless hordes of sandy bastards then you can drop down in amongst them at any point and go out all guns blazing. I do this myself from time to time, but ultimately I do find speed kills to be a handy tool to have at your disposal. 
Okay, so onto the action platforming now, and I'll just get stuck into all the new environmental additions we have here, because there certainly are a fair share of them. The platforming mechanics themselves are honestly still bloody outstanding, even three games in, or heck, even in 2020, nothing at all feels dated about the boundless control we have over the Prince. He still has his vast bundle of moves that we've gotten so used to over the past couple of outings, as well as his crucial sand powers, but this time round, they really went all out in trying to maximise the Prince's agile skills by introducing many new elements elements of the environment that the prince and his alter ego can interact with. We now have dagger grates, diagonal rebounds, dagger switches, mountable chains, close walls and vertical poles to chain across. I'm sure I've probably missed something else there that was introduced but as you can tell even by those that I've managed to recall, there's quite a lot of new stuff here to help you traverse each locale. Honestly, I love every one of these new additions bar the dagger grate which I think is simply overused throughout the entirety of the game. The diagonal rebound is my favourite as it looks so effortlessly cool, springboarding from one ledge to another in a split second and even bouncing right across rooms in brief occasions. Not quite sure that the physics of these devices hold up very well but they keep the pace of the gameplay up no end. I'd say this game's slightly easier than Moria Within in terms of platforming, since each place usually does just consist of you finding a way down to the ground for a fight with the sand monsters. Half the time the only real peril you face is falling to your death as the usual corridors of traps and deadly devices don't make nearly as many appearances as before. Don't get me wrong, when they do litter the hallways they honestly consist of the best layouts of the whole series, with an all new circular saw weapon that causes all sorts of problems. I just wish we had more demanding areas filled with these booby traps instead of empty streets and rooftops for half the game. Moving on now we have what seems to be the most polarising new addition to the game, in the form of sporadic chariot courses that have you taking the reins of some horses and racing through the plundered streets of Babylon. These predominantly play out like short Hollywood eyes segments that briefly freshen up the gameplay and get the prince from A to B in no time at all. I'm a huge fan of these chariot chases quite honestly, a guilty pleasure I suppose. They only crop up twice, we never get overbearing and the controls handle accurately for the most part. It's not just a simple street sprint though, as you carefully navigate the terrain, battle against sand chariots and kill enemies that dive onto your vehicle. It's all harmless fun and takes you through some wonderful diverse scenery, adding even more scope and scale to the city. My only gripe is that I maybe wish they'd set one of these courses at night or something to help differentiate between the two segments, as they do feel remarkably similar to each other, aside from the length. Apart from the chariots, there's also a brief mini boss fight against a moat monster that finishes with you riding on the creature's back and controlling them all through the compact canals. Again, I'm a big fan. As always, I've saved the best till last, as we have to discuss the single biggest gameplay overhaul in the Two Thrones, the Dark Prince portions. Our prince transforms into his corrupted alter ego a good dozen times or so throughout the story, and in doing so, unleashes his untapped potential in terms of combat and platforming. I've already spoken about the plethora of great new moves that the Dark Prince can perform with the Dagger Tail while he's amidst a group of sand creatures, but this embedded weapon also increases the Prince's reaching range dramatically when platforming. He can now hook the Dagger Tail onto poles and lamps that jut out from the wall in order to gain more momentum in his course of action. As well as that, the tail can also be utilised to pull out cement coloured switches which open nearby doors. These unique environmental components only appear in the Dark Prince section of gameplay, meaning that he can use his unique powers to surpass otherwise impossible parts of the landscape. Aside from the welcoming new gameplay mechanics, we also get an entirely new look for our protagonist when the transformation takes place. His physical appearance is altered drastically as he now sports a normally long flowing hair and a black colour scheme with sand trails flowing all through his body. I don't know if it was intentional, but his look always reminds me of volcanic rock with molten lava running through it. Sounds daft I know, but given the fact that they had the prince have to consciously burn himself in order to change into his darker side in early Kindred Blades gameplay, it maybe holds some credence. Like the Sandwraith section in Warrior Within, our life fades away as we play as the Dark Prince, although this time at a much faster rate. The life bar present in this game is a fair bit shorter to begin with, so when it starts depleting, it becomes a true race against the clock as you traverse each level. Thankfully, your health can be fully regenerated by obtaining the Sands of Time, which are again held within breakable objects in the foes you take down. The crucial difference this time is that the life bar mercilessly empties entirely, meaning you'll perish within a minute or so if you don't seek out sand. Even though breakable objects are plentiful through most of the Dark Prince sections, it can become really troublesome to make it through trap riddled portions later in the game on low health, and to add salt to the wound your sand tanks don't refill in this form either, so you need to spare every last rewind in your reserves. The Dark Prince is undoubtedly my favourite addition to the game. His potions always seem to enhance all elements of the gameplay and force you to change your playing style if you want to make it through these without continually slumping to your death. 
In terms of puzzle solving, it's much the same story as we've had with the last two outings, although there does seem to be a good deal more pressure plate pushing and lever pulling this time round to open every single door. Quite honestly, these can get a bit tiresome as they're probably the most time consuming action that the Prince can perform. On the other side of things, the puzzle solving platforming elements are better than ever, as you have to use every single little environmental aid to time your descent perfectly in each and every location. There is one main puzzle in the game though, where you have to gradually rotate a giant statue of your father through a royal workshop, eventually getting it to crash through a wall so you can make your escape. I despise this fucking shamble of a puzzle in its entirety. It completely kills the pace of the game as you keep making your way up and down ladders to two opposite platforms which control the statue. Even when you finally found out which way you need to turn the bastard to get it moving, it takes minutes on end to actually cross over and crank four separate levers this way and that. For me, it's the worst puzzle in the trilogy and laborious to work through. I'm always so glad when an exciting chariot chase kicks into gear straight after this slog. Truthfully, the level design in this game is a right mixed bag. Some areas feature platforming designs that are just off the charts in terms of enjoyment, but others have you just traipsing through cramped and rather lifeless sections of the city. It's a bit disappointing that they completely get rid of the open world idea from Warrior Within. That game was still linear with its gameplay, but at least it let you decide which task to complete first at times, or if you wanted to return to a certain area if you felt you missed something. I moaned about the excessive backtracking present in Island of Time, but honestly, that was a pretty small price to pay when the whole experience felt so seamlessly interconnected. It did feel like you had the whole island to explore at your own pace, even though that wasn't necessarily true. Here, in Two Thrones, we're on rails for the entire journey. There's no choice on the player's part, no separate paths to take and multiple endings to discover. It's all an intensely linear process. Don't get me wrong, Sands of Time was the same in this regard, but I think after we get the taste for some non-linear levels in the Island of Time, it just seemed a bit cheap to throw all that out the window and return to a complete beeline design. Let me be clear, I'm not looking for any real resemblance of an Assassin's Creed open style world here, but any essence of freedom would be greatly appreciated throughout the journey. Most of the early levels have a rather rinse and repeat feel to them, where you appear at the top of a surprisingly cramped open area and have to work in traversing your way down to the bottom, where a showdown awaits you as you fight the closed sand portals spread all over the city. There's not much diversity throughout these levels, and it feels like the game's an autopilot for large chunks. We eventually start receiving assistance from Farah, which helps freshen things up a great deal, but even in. We aren't receiving many new objectives as the game wears on, it's just we need to find and kill the vizier from beginning to end. It just so happens though that these rather dreary areas are balanced out perfectly as we are also treated to some of the most complex, impressive levels in the whole series. The design and craftsmanship put into some of the better locales in the game honestly rinse away the sour taste from before as we must navigate our way through an artsy array of captivating vistas from time to time. Like always, I'll go over a few of my favourite levels in the game, and actually, this time round there was too many to choose from, so I just picked out a few that possessed the most uniqueness and switched up the gameplay the most efficiently. Early in the game we fall into the sewers and come to realise exactly what the sands of time have done to us. This creepy network of slippery walkways and marvellous platforming resources is the perfect place for the Dark Prince to come out and play. Being sandwiched in amongst many hours of meandering through streets and palaces also helps this sinister, eerie environment to stand out. Another great area that separates long city roaming segments is the brothel. This is a phenomenal change of pace as we gallivant through this alluring architecture that brings back pleasant memories of the bathhouses from Sands of Time. This portion of the game looks wildly different from many others and concludes with one of the neatest looking trap ridden corridors of them all. My favourite level in the game however is without doubt the Well of Ancestors. This mystical well shines with blue flickers of light and is designed beyond perfection to allow you to harness all the momentum possible when using the Dark Prince's dagger tail to circle your way down. It contains such intriguing ominous scenery and again is infested with a multitude of challenging corridors all laid out to stop you in your tracks. You also get your reward at the end of this challenging section in the form of your father's glowing sword, which can once again one hit kill all enemies. I've just noticed that the three specific levels I happen to have picked out all include lengthy Dark Prince gameplay. They really did just elevate certain parts of the Two Thrones to another level. One quick thing of note that's an extreme disappointment is the severe lack of secrets to be discovered throughout the city. There's six life upgrades and a few measly chests containing sand tokens for artwork, and that's it. There's very little to go hunting for off the beaten track in this adventure, and the life upgrades we do come across are irregular to say the least. No longer do we have to shatter cracked walls or venture through long hidden passages overrun with traps, 
Instead we just advance through ambiguous side routes and come across a rather ugly looking magic drinking fountain. Then we have to go through a random test of sorts to get the upgrade itself and then backtrack the way we came. It just feels odd and I wish they'd have kept the setup from Moria within because that made much more sense than this. To conclude this review, let's go over the boss fights, of which there are four of yet again. I know myself, I've probably given this game a great deal of unexpected flack for the last half hour, but we'll end on a true high note as the boss battles in the two thrones are unarguably the greatest of the trilogy, by far. Got another simple combat orientated face offs, this time round we must use a great deal of environmental and stealth mechanics to our advantage as we platform around each adversary. The bosses we face were all former generals of the vizier, so it makes sense to take them down one by one before finally making your way up to the vizier himself. The first boss fight in the arena is perhaps the greatest of them all, even if it is just because your opponent is a 60 foot jawless goliath who kicks and swipes at you constantly. It's probably the most memorable moment of the game as you stab his eyes and he's fumbling around blind, kicking thin air. The second boss is an incredibly agile and unpredictable female opponent called Mahasti. Mahasti? Mahasti? I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that to be honest. Anyway, she can only be taken out by slowing down time and relentlessly slashing her with the dagger tail. This fight is definitely the weakest of the bunch as it consists of repeating the same move over and over, but it's still preferable over a simple round of combat. Then we come across the twin warriors who wield an axe and sword respectively and gang up on the prince after surrounding him in a ring of fire. This is arguably the hardest battle of the trilogy as the only possible way to defeat them is by focusing solely on the sword wielding twin until the other cleaves his axe into the ground, leaving him open to an attack. Eventually you'll get the chance to speed kill them, but if you finish the chariot section beforehand with no sand tanks remaining, then it's going to be one hell of a challenge for you. The final battle has you face off against the mighty half crab, half butterfly himself. This battle is a hundred times better than that damp squib we were unfortunately graced with at the end of Sands of Time. Here, the finale is lengthy, as his fight is conveniently split up into three different sections. First, we simply swipe at him and dodge his attacks. Then we have to avoid suckling rocks while attempting to launch a stealth kill on the ever moving vizier. And finally we have to platform up and across the cleverly arranged mass of rubble before plunging the dagger of time into his evil bastard and heart. Each boss fight here truly stands out and unexpectedly turn out to be a few of the real highlights within this adventure. Who would have thought that when two games ago they were hardly even worth mentioning? Ok, so I think it's clear to everyone that I've pointed out a great deal more negatives with this instalment than I did with the previous two combined, and yeah, the Two Thrones does have a handful of issues which hold it back from being an all round outstanding game, but I'm still hugely fond of it despite of this. It's clear that the developers weren't quite sure what they wanted this game to be, so it takes a lighter tone and elegant setting from Sands of Time, and mixes it in with the extreme violence and darker visuals from Warrior Within. Even our original voice actor is back as the prince and I think that was a masterful decision in helping bring back the affectionate charm from before. I do not like pomegranates. What is wrong with you? They are messy, impossible to eat with dignity. But a part of me does often wonder how dark the story could have gotten had we seen the exact same prince return from the island of time, voice actor and all, and promoting the dark prince up to be the main antagonist for the game instead of the vizier. After all, I can't help thinking this is what they originally had in mind, given the shadowy teaser of him at the end of Warrior Within. Anyway, all that aside, this is still a legitimately thrilling final chapter to this epic trilogy, and every instalment stands the test of time admirably. I would say that The Two Thrones is my least favourite out of the three, but it's still a great experience that I return to often and would wholeheartedly recommend to any gamers out there. It's maybe not the conclusion we expected, but it's a commendable closure to the series no doubt, and sporadically does offer up the very best from both our previous adventures.